one of my branded memories in my young life was seeing you as Cordelia in John Colacus's arms at the end of Lear. I mean, it's branded in my in my image memory. I will never forget it. There are large parts of that production I never forget. Mm -hmm. So he's a very different director mm -hmm. than John Hirsch, who seems to have this uh, passionate vision, a breadth of passionate vision that sometimes we Canadians are not quite up to grasping, which who tormented us at times because his vision was wider. Mm -hmm. But Langham did something else to us, it seems to me, and I certainly saw it in the in the King Lear. What was that like working with Langham? Well, I was afraid of Michael. I don't think I was afraid of John, but I was afraid of Michael, and again worshipped him. Um, he looked like the the Duke of Windsor, not the present Duke of Windsor, but the. Edward, uh, who abdicated right. that Duke of Windsor, David. And I just thought he was the most beautiful, handsome thing I'd ever seen. And I, I always called him Mr. Langham. I never called him Michael. Um, and I was, he was my first director the, when, the very first time I was at Stratford. Um, although I only worked with him the first year on, um, uh, in Cyrano de Bergerac when I played several very small parts, and this was good because I was so tongue-tied around him I couldn't possibly ever have worked with him in that first year. And so the Lear came in the second, second year or third year? I can't quite remember, but the Lear came very soon after that, but it wasn't my first year there. And um, the, the moment I remember most about Michael was in, in my second year, when I was doing Troilus and Cressida. And again, I couldn't get what he wanted. And I was trying and trying, and I was, I was trying very hard um, to be brave and professional about this and pretend that uh, I was a real working actor like all the other working actors I saw around me and not some silly, sniveling girl. And so I was uh, trying very hard to to give him what was required in the scene when Cressida leaps up on the bench and, and squeals at the, all the soldiers that she sees marching by in the distance. And we kept trying and trying and trying, and he clearly was dissatisfied and couldn't get what he wanted. And, and I kept trying, and I was determined not to give up. And finally, the last time we went through it, I jumped up on the, the, the tumpty there around the center pillar we finished the scene and I was left standing there as he went to do something else and as he went by he took my hand and squeezed it because he knew that I was in a dangerous way and I'd been fine until then and as soon as he did that I burst into tears and I couldn't stop all day long. Mm -hmm. I just cried and cried and cried and cried. <laughs> well I try not to do that anymore. Um, was he an intellectual director? Yes, I think he was. He he always plotted the play out most specifically. He did what I used to call tent pegs. He would put um, various scenes, literally nailed, sometimes literally nail them into the floor, um, certainly in the beginning of the scene and the end of the scene, and he'd usually find a couple of places in the middle of the scene where there was something very specific asked for. So you would have to go there. You would have to do this. And then in between, he would leave air so that you could, um, you still had to go in that straight line, but uh, depending on the length of the line, you had room to breathe. You and mean the you, events of the scene? You, yes. You don't mean the physical blocking? I mean that too. Yes, yes, oh. in, in both senses, in both senses. So that you, you had to, if you started downstage right, you would have eventually there would be a point at which you would have to go to upstage, upstage right, downstage, downstage left. You would eventually have to go to upstage right, and um, his blocking was so specific according to the intent of the scene that the physical moves um, corresponded with the major beats, if you like, of the scene too. So that if you had a move, that would be where something had changed. Now, there might be little changes in between, or there might be smaller moves, um, but generally speaking, the blocking and the intent were matched. Predetermined? 
um, pretty well, as far as I could see. Although he didn't use any notes, but uh, I think he always knew before going into a scene what he was going to do with it. Now, mind you, many of these plays he had directed many times before. So it may just be that he's like a great conductor. His knowledge of the score of the script was so immense that he could block vast numbers of people um, off the top of his head. But I suspect that he he did a great deal of homework, that he studied things Those two quite never specifically. Met, did they? Hirsch and Langham? They were apart. They were in their separate times. yeah, separate times. I, I can't think of two more. They must have people. met, right. I would think. But the sort of intellectual wildfire of John Hirsch yeah. and this careful, cerebral, thorough wisdom of Michael Langham. Yeah. See. And Michael's cerebral um, point of view it has contains a great deal of wildfire. He was uh, quite electrifying in a rehearsal. In what he was way? Not, well, um, just things like that, like that, that scene I described where he, he took my hand. Up until that point, it, it was very crackling. Um, he, uh, he did not suffer fools gladly, and he would be very quick to call someone on the carpet if they weren't immediately there, if they hadn't done their homework, if mm -hmm. they lost a line, if they, if they weren't up to speed with everybody else. He didn't expect you to be, he didn't expect you to do uh, impossible things, but he did expect you to be on time, prepared, and ready to work, and to work completely full out. He had no patience for anything else. Now, in, in thinking of Michael Langer, am I right in remembering that he was one of the first directors who, actually the sub subject sort of want to put on the table here, is that... Uh, we were all, we presumed the best way to do Shakespeare was the British way, and therefore there were a lot of mid-Atlantic accents or, you know, people from Toronto with accents from South London. And then there was a shift in the early 60s, was there not, when it was, no, you can actually speak in your own tongue with your own accent, mm -hmm. that that is authentic as anything from received pronunciation. Now, was Michael Langham part of that? Yes, he certainly was. He used to ask us, to speak with a Canadian accent. Um, of course, he couldn't speak with a Canadian accent, and I'm not sure that he could always hear a Canadian accent, but he, he wanted us not to do uh, broad A's. He wanted us not to drop R's. He wanted, I guess that's what resulted, in fact, in a kind of mid-Atlantic sound, because his ear wasn't necessarily tuned to a Canadian accent, but he didn't want us to mimic him. He didn't want it to be an English accent. Why? What were his reasons? Because we were in Canada. Because none of us did an English accent as well as English actors. Because he knew that um, we couldn't tap our resources if we were pretending to be another uh, nationality. I think that's why. Right. As you assume an accent, you put on a bit of a mask, and the moment you put on a mask, then you are separated from part of yourself. Mm -hmm. And Robin was very uh, adamant about that, that we not use English accents. Because that was a turning point for, as an, a young actor in Toronto, you know, doing Canadian plays. It was a, a bit of a, a hinge in our history that, no, we should play these plays with, with our sounds, yeah. not like their sounds or their sounds, but no. we were worthy enough to have those sounds in our mouths. And, that and was isn't important. it ironic that it was two English directors at Stratford who caused that shift to happen? 